The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. Chapter 5. De Luce, De Luce, Do, Do, Man. The sheep ran huddling together against the hurdles, blowing out thin nostrils and stamping with delicate forefeet, the heads thrown back, and a light stream rising from the crowded sheep pen into the frosty air. The two animals hastened by high in high spirits, which with much chatter and laughter, they were turning across the country after a long day's outing with Otter, hunting, exploring the wide uplands where certain streams to the river tree to their own wither had their very had, had their first small beginnings. The shades of salt winter day were closing in on them. They had still some distance to go, plodding at round across the plough, they had heard the sheep and they made for them, and now leading for the sheep pen, they found a beaten track, and made walking a lighter business, and responded, moreover, to the small inquiring something which all animals carry inside them, saying unmistakably, yes, quite right, this leads home. It looks as if we're going coming to a village, the mole somewhat dubiously, slackening his pace as the track and had in time become a path, then developed into the lane, now handed them over to charge a well metal road. And was did not hold with villages, their highways thickly frequented as they were, took an independent course regardless of church, post office, or public house. I oh, never mind, said a rat. At times, like, at times of the year, they were all safe indoors. By this time, sitting around a fire, men, women, and children, dogs and cats and all. We should slip through all night, we're all right. Without any bother and pleasantness, we can take a lot of them through their windows, if you like, to see what they're doing. A rabbit nightfall, mid-December, and quite beset the little village as they approached it on the soft foot over first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible with squares a dusty orange light Irish red on either side of the street where the firelight or lamplight for each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world about. Most of the these windows were innocent of blinds. To look lookers in from outside inmates gathered around the tea table, absorbed in handiwork, a talking with laughter and gesture with each a happy grace which is the last thing Skilled actors shall capture an ancient grace which goes with perfect unconsciousness of association. Moving at will, one fear to another, two spectators so far from home themselves. There's something of a wistfulness in their eyes. They watch the cat being stroked, the sleepy child picked up and held off to bed. A tired man stretch and knock out his pipe in the end of a smouldering log. It is from one little window, with its blind drawn down, a mere blank transparency on the night. That a sense of home, the little curtained world, thin walls, a larger stressful world, outside nature shut out, forgotten, must partake, must postate, most postated. Close against the wide blind, hung a birdcage, clearly silhouetted, every wire perched and a, a Approach a great pretense distinct and recognisable even to yesterday's dull edged lump of sugar. The per- middle perch of fluffy occupant, head tucked into the feathers, seemed so near to them to be easily stroked, and they, had they tried, even the delicate tips of his pruned out plumage pencilled plainly on the illuminated screen as he looked, the sleepy little fellow stirred uneasily, woke shook himself and raised his head. He could see the gape of his tiny beak. He yawned, bored stiff away, looked at the ground and settled his head to his back again, while the ruffled feathers gradually subsided into perfect stillness. A gust of bitter wind took them off in the back of his neck. A small sting of frozen sleep on the skin woke them from a dream. They knew their toes were to be so be cold and their legs tired, their own home distant, 
a weary way. Once upon beyond the village, where the cottages ceased abruptly, either side of the road they could smell from the darkness the friendly fields again. They braced themselves for the last stretch, long stretch, home stretch, a stretch that we know is bound to end. Sometime the rattle of the bell latch, the sound of the firelight, the sight of familiar things greeting us the long absent travellers from far off over sea. They plodded along steadily and silently, each of them thinking his own thoughts. The moles ran a great deal on supper as it was pitch dark. It was all. Um, it was all a strange country for him, as far as he knew. He was following obediently in the wake of the rat. Even the guidance contorted to him. As the rat, he was walking a little way ahead, as his habit was. His shoulders humped, his eyes fixed on a straight grey road in front of him. So he did not notice poor Mole, when suddenly the summons reached him. It took him like an electric shock. We others who have long since lost their more subtle tunnel of, of physical senses, have not even proper t- have not even proper terms to express an animal's inter communications with its surroundings as living forever by boys. They could uh, their own, have only the word smell, for instance, to include the whole range of delicate thrills which murmur in the nose, the animal light and day, summer warning. It's slightly repelling. It's one of those mysterious fairy pitfalls. Without the void, it suddenly reached Marlin in darkness, making him tingle through and through. With his very familiar appeal, even while well, yet he could not clearly remember what it was, he stopped dead in his tracks. His nose searching hither and thither in its efforts to recapture that fine figment, figment, filament, paint. The telegraphic current that they had so strongly moved him. A moment he had caught in it again, and with it, its time came with collection in fullest flood. Home, that was what they, they meant. Those caressing appeals, those soft touches weft through the air. Some invisible hands pulling and tugging all one way. Why, well, it must be very, be quite close by him at that moment. His old home, he had hurriedly forsaken, never saw again the day when he first found the river. And now he's sending out its scouts and its messengers, catching and bringing him in. Since his escape on that bright morning, he had hardly given a thought. But old had he been, new life and all its pleasures, surprise its flesh and captivating experiences. Now a rush of old memories, now clearly it stood up before him in the darkness. Shabby knee, was small and poorly furnished, yet here's the home he had made for himself. Home he'd been happy to get back to after his day work, and home been happy with him, too eventually missing and wanting him back, turning him in through his nose, sorrowfully, reproachfully, but with no bitterness or anger, only a plaintive reminder it was there and wanted him. The call was clear, the summons was plain. He must obey it instantly and go ratting. He called full of joy, full of excitement. Hold on, come back, I want you quick. Oh, come along, Mel, do, replied the rat, cheerfully plodding around long. Please stop, ratty, pleaded Mel, poor Mel, in the English of heart. You don't understand, it's my home, my old home. Just come across the smell of it. It's closed by here. Really quite close. I must go to it. I must. I must. Oh, come back, Ratty. Please come back. Please, please come back. The rat was by this time very far ahead. Too far. She had clearly what the mole was calling. Too far to catch a sharp note. Painful appeal. His voice. He's too much taken up. The weather. To be too. So he could too. But he too could smell something. Something suspicious. Like approaching snow. Well, we can't stop now, really, he had to call back. We'll come for it tomorrow. Whatever it might, whatever it might, it is where you, you found it, you found it. I don't, I don't stop now. It's late. The snow's coming up again. I'm not sure that way. I want your nose. Well, so come on quick. Here's a good fellow. 
rat pressed forward on his way without wanting for an answer. Poor Mole stood alone in the road, his heart torn asunder. Big stop gathering, gathering somewhere low down inside him. So let to leap up service presently, he knew in passionate escape. But even under such a test as his loyalty's friend stood firm, never for a moment did he dream of abandoning him. Meanwhile, the wraths from his old home pleaded, whispered, and conjured, conjured, and finally claimed him perilously. He dared not tally longer than within this magic, uh, magic circle. A wrench that tore very heartstrings, he set his face down the road and followed submissively the track of the rat, while faint, thin little smells, still dogging, retreating nose, approached him for his new friendship, his callous forgetfulness. With an effort, he called up to the respecting rat, who began chattering cheerfully about how, what they would do when they got, got back, and how jolly a fire and log a parlour would be, while the supper he meant to eat. They were noticing his companion's silence and distressing state of mind, restful state of mind. Last, however, when he had gone some considerable way, furthermore, pot, were passing trees and tree stumps at the edge of the corpse. The board of the road, he stopped and said, Connie, look here, my old, old chap, you seem dead tired. No need, no talk left in you. In you, and your feet dragging like lead. We we'll sit down here for a minute and rest. That's not as old as off so far. The best part of our journey's over. Moles has said he's on a tree stump and tried to console himself, but he felt it surely coming. The salt he had fought for so long of refused to be beaten. Up and up it forced its way into the air. Then another, another, another's thick and fast, put till poor old Mole last gave up the struggle, cried freely and helplessly, openly. Now that he knew he was all over, he lost what he could hardly be said to have found. Rat astonished and dismayed the violence of Mole's paralysis on the grief. Do not dare to speak of it for a while. Lasted very quietly and perfectly. perfectly. What is it, old fellow? Whatever can be, be the matter. Tell us your trouble. Let me see what can, I can do. Poe found it difficult to get to any words out beyond the heavals of his chest and followed him once another upon, followed one upon another so quickly held back speech and choked. At it, 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 as it came, I know it, it's, it's a shabby little dingy place. He stopped forth at last, broke not like your cosy quarters or toes, beautiful hole of Badger's great house. It's my little home. I was fond of it. I went away and forgot all about it. Then I smelt it suddenly on the road when I called you. Wouldn't cut visit back. Everything came back to me with a rush. I wanted it. Oh dear, oh dear. When you wouldn't turn back, Ratty, I had to leave it. Though I was running all the time, I thought my heart would break. We might have just gone. I had one last look at it, Ratty. Only one look. It was close by, but you wouldn't turn back, Ratty. You wouldn't turn back. Oh, dear, oh, dear. It kept your book first ways of sorrow. I sobbed again, took full charge of him, preventing further speech. Rat stared straight in front of him, saying nothing, and he patted Mole up gently on the shoulder. By the time he muttered gloomily, I'll see it all now. What a pig. I'll be a pig. That's me. I just a pig, a plain pig. He waited till Mars sobs became gradually less stormy and more rippled. He waited till the last sniffs of the frequent sobs on the end of the He rose his seat and remarkably cooed. Carelessly. Well now, we really better be getting on, old chap. Set off the road again. Over the tomb so 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 way they had come. I set off the road again. Oh, the troublesome way they had come. Well, there you are going to, Betty, <laughs> going to, I bet, Betty, cried out, cried to, to the tearful mole. Look at him now. You're going to find the home of yours, old oh, fellow. Find him out, man, I say. So he had better come along. He's going to take some finding. So he should have want your nose. I'll come back, Betty. Do, cried the mole. Get up and hurrying after him. It's no good, I'll tell you. It's too late and too dark. Place is far too off. Too far off. Snow's coming. 
I never meant to let you know I was feeling that way, Barry. It was just an accident, a mistake. I think of Red R- Riverbank and your supper. I ain't Riverbank, you supper too, said Rat Hartman. I'll tell you, I'm going to find this place now, for I stay all night, so cheer up, old chap, and take my arm, and very soon be back there again. Still sniffing and pleading reluctant, Mole said to himself, to be drank along the road by a perilous companion, who might have flowed with cheerful talk, but then did endeavoured to beguile his spirits back and made a weary way seem shorter. But at last it seemed to the rat they must be nearing the part of the road where the mole had been held up, he said. Now, no more talking business. Use your nose and give your mind to it. Then they moved on silence for some little way, and suddenly Rat was con- conscious through his arm of linked in moles with a faint short of electrical feel and passing down the animal's body. Instantly he just gave himself go back the pace and waited waited all attention. Signals are coming through. Moles did a while moment rigid while his uplifted nose quivering slightly off the felt the air. A short quick run forward, a thought, a check, a turn back, then a slow, steady, confident advance. Rat most much excited, kept close to his heels at a mole, with some think in the air of a sleepwalker, crossed the dry ditch, scrambled for a hedge, nose his way over a field open and trackless, and bare the faint starlight. Tony went at some walk, a giving warning. He died, but the rat was on the alert. Promptly followed him down the tunnel, to which his unknowing nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless, and smelly earth smell was strong. It seemed a long time to rat. Uh, the, uh, pas- the passage ended, and he would stand erect and stretch and shake himself. A man always struck a match, and by it is like the match saw. He was standing over his face, neatly swept, and standing underfoot. And directly facing them was a mouse front the front door. Moen painted gothic lettering over the bowl pole and side. Moe reached out the lantern for nail on the wall and lit it. And Rat, looking back round him, saw they were in a sort of full court. A garden seat stood on one side of the door, and the other a roller. The mole was who was a dirty animal. The home could not stand having the ground kicked up by other animals till little to little rooms. It ended into earth heaps. On walls hung the wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets, carrying plaster, sanitary, Garibaldi, an in- infant for some male, and a Queen Victoria. Over here was a modern dudley. Down on one side of the forecourt ran a skid of women, with benches alongside it, little wooden tables marked with rings and heated a beer ring mugs. In the middle was a small ground pond containing goldfish. Surrounded by a cockle shell boulder. Out of the centre of the pond rose a fence for action, clothed in more silk cottage shells, topped by a large silver glass ball, reflecting everything all wrong, and a very pleasing effect. Mel's beam, face beam, the sight of all these adopsics. Oh, this so did him, hurried rack through the door. He lit the lamp in the hall and took one glance around his old home. He saw the dust lying Thick on everything, since a cheerless desertion. Look, look at the non neglected house, its narrow marriage. Dementors its worn and shabby contents, and collapsed again on a hall chair. He knows his poor ratty cried to me. Why did I ever do it? Why did I bring you to this poor, cold old place on a night like this, where you might have been at Riverbank by this time? Toasting your tones before blazing fire with your own nice things about you. But pay no heed to his doleful self approaches. He running here and there, opening doors, expecting ramp rooms, cupboards and lightning ramps, and candles and sticking them up else everywhere. What a capital well own this is, he cried up cheerfully. So compact, so well planned. Everything here and everything in this place. We'll make a jolly night of it. The first thing you've got to do is want is a good fire. I'll see that. I always know where to find things. So this is the parlour. Splendid. Your own idea. A little sleeping bunks in the wall. Capital. Now I'll fetch the wood and the coals and you get a dust of mould. 
You'll find one in the drawer on the kitchen table. I'm trying to smart things up a bit. But that's all right about old chap. Glad was his experimenting chamber chap companion. Mal roused himself and dusted the polish of energy and hotness while the rack running to and fro with armfuls of fuel soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. He held a mole to come and warm himself. A warm promptly had another fit, the blues dropping down on couch in a deep, dark despair, and facing burying his face in his duster. Rat, he moaned. How about your supper? You poor, cold, hungry, weary animal. Oh, I've nothing to give you. Nothing but a, not a crumb. Ratty moaned. How about your supper? You poor, cold, hungry, weary animal. I've nothing to give you. Nothing but a crumb. What a fellow like you giving in? You're giving in, said the rat poetry. Why, I only die now. Just saw a that salty opener, a kitchen dresser. Quite distinctly, and somebody knows that means there are sardines about somewhere in a fable. Rouse yourself, pull yourself together, come with me and forage. He went and foraged accordingly, hunting for every cupboard, returning at every drawer. Result was not so very depressing after all. Though, of course, it might have been better. Tin of sardines, <coughs> a box of captive biscuits, nearly full, a dome of sausage, and a case of silver paper. It's a banquet for you, observed the rat, as he rang the table. Oh, no, so I know it would give their ease to be sitting down, sat with us tonight. No bread, moaned but Mal dubiously. No butter, no paid of all gross, no champagne, <coughs> continued the rat, grinning. At the end remains me. What's that little door in the passage? You said, of course, every luxury in his house. Just wait a minute. <clears throat> he made for the cellar door and presently it appeared somewhat dusty and a bottle of beer in each paw and of each arm self indulgent bugger you seem to be bowl he observed deny yourself nothing it's really a jolliest little place that ever was in <coughs> I never made you pick up those point these prints. Make yourself make the place look so home like they do. No wonder they know you were so fond of it, Mole. Tell us all about it. How it came to make it what it is. And then with a the rat busied himself fetching plates, nice and false and mustard, which he mixed in egg cup, and mole his bosom, still heaving with stress of his recent emotion, laid his so much on it first, but with free more freedom, he warmed his subject. How this was planned and how this was brought out, how this got through a windfall, how this has got through a windfall from an art. That was a wonderful find a bargain. This other thing was brought out of laborious flavings, a certain amount of going out. But it's funny, quite the story story. He, might, he must needs go and caress his possessions, make a lamp and show off their points to his visitor, aspirate on them. Quite forgetful of the supper they both so much needed. Rat, who was especially hungry, was stove to conceal it, nodding seriously through its ceremony, a plucked brow, a saying one full, a most remarkable intervals when he glanced with a chance of observation had given him was given him. And last the rat succeeded in coining him a table, when they had got seriously to work with sardine opener, when sounds were heard from the full court without. Sounds like scuffing small feet, gravel, and a confused murmur of tiny voices, while broken senses to reach them. Now, all in the mind, turn the lanterns up a bit, Tommy, clear well your throats first. No coughing off, I say, so. one, two, three. Where is the young Bill? Here, yeah, come on, do, we're waiting. What's up? inquired a rat, pausing on his neighbours. I think I must be, you must be a field mice, replied the mouth, with a touch of pride in manner. They go around carousing regularly at this time of year. They're quite instituted in parts. They never pass me over. They come to Mose and last of all. We used to give them hot drinks to supper too sometimes, when they can afford it. And it will be like old times to hear them again. Let's have a look at them, cried the rat, jumping up and returning to the door. 
pretty sight of scenes of all one. They met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the full court, lit by the dim rays of the hell, the horn lantern, some knights or ten little film mice stood in semicircle, red worsened, cumbers round their throats, their foreheads thrust deep into their pockets, their feet jibbing for months, their bright, beady eyes, they glanced shyly at each other, staring a little, snuffling, and applying coat sleeves a great deal. As the door opened, one of the elder ones had carried a light in the same. Now you're in two, one, two, three. Well then, their little shrill voices arose in the air singing one of the old time carols their forefathers composed in the fields when they fell over and held by frost, or when snow bound in chimney corners and handed down to be snug in the murray street to lamp lit windows at your time. Cows wiggled as the oldest frosty sign. Let your carol door swing open wide. The wind may follow and bow beside. Yet draw us in your fire to bide. Joy shall be yours in the morning. Here we stand in cold and sleep. Blowing fingers and stamping feet. Come from far away you greet. You to greet by your fire and wave in the street. Finding you enjoy the morning. For here after the night was gone, stand as a star that led us on, raining bliss and by sun, on. bliss tomorrow and more and on, joy for every morning. Go down, man, Joseph, toiled through the snow, saw the star of sky below, Mary she might not go further go, welcome fetch and little below, joy was hers in the morning. And then they heard the angels tell, who was the first animal to cry in a well? And it was all as it befell. The stable there did they dwell. Joy shall be yours in the theirs in the morning. Voices ceased the singers bashful, the smiling exchanged sidelong glances. But for the moment only. Then from above, far away down the tunnel, so lately troubled that it was born to their ears, a faint musical sound of distant bells. Ringing a joyful and clamorous peal. Very well sung, boys, cried the rat heartily. And now come along all in. Now come along in. All you, warm yourself by the fire. Have something hot. Yes, come along, Phil, my squad of man. Eagerly, it's quite like old times. Shut the door after you. Pile up with that city settle to the fire. Now you must wait a minute while we are wetting. Cried his bear pumping down on the seat with tears of belly. What are we going to be doing? We've enough to give him. You leave that to me, said the master rat. Here, here you are with the lantern. Come over this way. I want to talk to you. Now tell me, are you in any shops at this hour of the night? Why, certainly, sir, replied the field mouse respectfully. This time, now here, our shops keep open for all sorts of hours. Then look here, said the rat. You go off at once. You and your lantern get me... Here much muttered conversation soon. Mal only heard bits of it, such as fresh mine. No pound that'll do. See, you've got beggars, for I'll not have any other. No, only the best. You can't get it there. Try someone else. It's a cost of bone made. No tin stuff. Well then, do the best you can. Finally, there's a clink of coin passing from pearl to pearl. Pearl must have provided with ample basket for the poker scissors. Luffy hurried and he and his lantern. The rest of the filmers perched in a row on the settle, their small legs swinging, gave themselves up to enjoyment of fire, and toasted their chilblains till they singled, while the mole fairly to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history, made each one of them recite the names of his numerous brothers, who were too young in the pit of it to appear. Be allowed to be, go out carrying this year. But he looked forward very shortly to winning the parental consent. Right, meanwhile, the busy mince man in his labour, one of the big bottles. I perceive this is the old button, he marked approvingly. So, so, mole. The very thing now we should be able to mole some wine L. Get the things ready, mole. Well, I draw the f- corks. It did not take long to pair the brew, thrust the tin heater. Well, the red heat of the fire, 
As soon as we feel most of sipping the coffee, we choke it for a little more wine. El goes a long way. A wipe in his eyes, laughing, forgetting he ever been cold in all his life. But he had pleased too, these fellows, said the mole, explained the rat. Made them up all by yourselves and ate them, only, uh, them afterwards. Very well he do, too. They gave, they gave us a couple one last year. But I feel myself captured at the right sea by Barnaby Corsair. Made a row in the gallery. When he escaped, got home again. He laid over gone to covenant. Here you. Well, you, you were in it. I remember. Give up the sight a bit. Phil most of rest, got up on his legs, giggled shyly, looked around his room and remained absolutely tongue-tied. Comrades cheered him on. Mel coaxed and carried him. Rack went so far to take him. They showed and shook him. But nothing could overcome his stage fright. They were all busy engaged on him. Like all of them applying the royal humane society regulations, cases of long submersion. When the fierce clicked, door opened the film mice, Lantern appeared, staggering under weight of the most basket. There's no more talking, play acting, since the real, very real, solid contents of the basket had been tumbled out, table under the generalship of rat. Everybody was set to do something or fetch something. In a very few minutes, supper was ready. Mal, he took the lantern to the table, saw a dream, saw a little, lately, barren bald, sick, thick, with savoury comforts, saw his little friends. Faces bright in the drain, they fell so about the lane. They let himself loose, for he was famished of digging, a provide ender, bender, to a medic provided, thinking it was a happy homecoming, he said, turn off all, as they all, they ate. He talked of old times, the film which gave him a local gossip, all up to date, and answered as well. They had come, could, the hundred questions he had to ask them. Rat said little or nothing. Only taking care of each guess of what he wanted, and plenty of it, and had more and no trouble and anxiety about everything. They clattered off last, at last, very grateful, and showing, showing wishes of the freedom. They had jacket pockets stuffed, remembrances of the small brothers and sisters at home. When the door was closed, the last of them, the clink of the lanterns had died away. Mal and Rat kicked up the fire up, drew the chairs and room themselves, a last nightcap of mulled wine, mulled ale, and discussed the events of a long day. At last, the rat was tremendous yawn, said, Oh, old chap, I'll go and eat need to drop. Sleep is well, sleep is not a word. That's your own back over on that side. Very well, then, I'll take this. What a ripping old little house this is. Everything's so handy. He clambered up in his bank, rolled himself well on the blankets, and slumber gathered in full with the sway of a barney, is folded into the arms of the reaping machine. Ray Mal also was glad to turn in without delay. Soon had his head a pillow in his great joy and contentment. But here he, but here he closed his eyes. He let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight. They played or rested of familiar and friendly things, which long been unconsciously a part of him. Now Smiley received him back the back were calm, were calm. He was now in just the frame, frame of mind. A tactful rat had clearly worked to bring him about him, in, about in him. He saw clearly how plain and simple, how narrow even it all it was, but clearly too. How much it all meant to him. Special veil ve- ve- for such, some such anguish, one's existence. He did not at all want to abandon any life. He spent his spaces. He turned his back on the sun and air, but all he offered him to creep to creep home and stay there. The apple well was still too strong. It called to him still, even down there. He knew he must return to the larger stage. But it's good to think he had he had, had this come back to this place, which was all his own, his things which were glad to see him again, but could always be counted upon. The same simple Welcome.